Good evening. Uh, for those of you who have been uh, regulars at this Adventure of Faith series, you know that this is actually the sixth in our series, which began last year. And uh, we hope, God willing, to have two more in the fall. Uh, we've been following, as you remember, the Creed, and we've arrived today at the Holy Spirit. Uh, when Father Neenan first uh, gave me the full title, I thought it was a misprint. I thought he meant to say, the Holy Spirit and the color of the paraclete. Instead, it was the color of your parachute. So we will see what happens. Uh, Father Neenan will actually be introduced by Brian Garrett. Brian is a senior in the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, the uh, co-chair coordinator of the Appalachia product, uh, Project, uh, which, as I understand, actually involves 550 BC students, which is an incredible thing for uh, BC students. He also tells me he's from Maryland and has a particular local pride, uh, which I fully appreciate, as does Father Neenan, because as you know, Father Neenan has a particular local pride as well. Uh, he comes from one of those states west of the Hudson River. Uh, I know it begins with an I, but I never can remember if it's Illinois or Indiana. It's one of those. In any case, it's my pleasure first to introduce Brian Garrett. Um, well, firstly, I'd just like to thank Father and Belly for those kind words and in introducing me. Uh, I'd also like to now just kind of turn the tables and return uh, those kind words in the direction of Father Neenan and introduce him, our speaker tonight. Uh, he has been so kind enough to come here and talk to us uh, in this Church in the 21st Century series about uh, the Holy Spirit and what is the color of your parachute, which is a very intriguing title. Uh, I know I'm in <laughs> excited to hear about it. But as uh, Father Mbelli was just talking about, um, you know, Father Neenan hails uh, from the great land of Iowa, I believe it is. And as we were just talking about, he has a lot of pride in that. I know he attended St. Louis University as an undergrad, and he also worked there to earn his master's in uh, economics as well as licentia in theology. And after that, he moved on to University of Michigan, where he earned a PhD in economics. And he moved on from there to begin his teaching career. It was kind of led up until 1979, where he came to Boston College here and begun working for us over the past 25 years. Um, he's worked right now. He is the vice president of Boston College, as well as a special assistant to Father Leahy, our president. But more than that, he has a very innate ability, very unique ability to connect with students here on campus. I know personally, just working with the Appalachia Volunteers Program, just how much he's given of himself to us. Without hesitation, he's been able to come in and talk to both the council as well as to the entire program to lend his words of advice to us. If you are ever looking for Father Neenan, you really don't need to look too much further than the Eagle's Nest. I know he's hanging out there at least once a week with any number one of uh, any number of Boston College students always hanging around having a peanut butter and jelly sandwich talking about anything from Christian ethics and French literature to the starting rotation of the St. Louis Cardinals which I know is his favorite team. Um, but I also have just one other story that I know I personally will always remember Father Neenan by and I know I've said this to a bunch of people before and if anyone in here has heard it before I apologize but I think it's incredibly telling just the character, the kind of man that uh, Father Neenan is. It occurred last year when I was a junior here at uh, Boston College, and I have a bunch of friends who are from Kansas, and they are incredibly huge Kansas Jayhawks fans. And I remember one night when the Kansas Jayhawks were playing uh, Missouri Tigers, and it was, if you don't know Big 12 basketball, it's a huge rivalry. So my friends were all geared up for it, and it was going to be a Monday night. They're going to play around 9 o'clock. And so I was going to head over to their place at Ignacio. And as I'm walking down the hall, just a couple minutes late, I can hear them cheering already from inside the dorm room. And as I walk through, the door is open, come right in, I just see a wave of blue. And right in the middle, middle was Father Neen and cheering just as loud as anyone else right there on a Monday night. And I think it's just, like I was saying, incredibly telling, just the kind of man that he is. And it's those little things that happen that I, uh, that I kind of understand and appreciate how privileged we are to have and like Father Neenan here on the Boston College campus. So without further ado, it's with great privilege and admiration that I introduce you to tonight's speaker, Father William Neenan. That's very kind, Brian. Thank you. 
I think the uh, Jayhawks won that night, too. I'm sorry, Father Barth from Mizzou, but I, that's, that's what happens, yeah. Um, well, friends, I have, I've written out some remarks. Uh, here, here they are. Uh, and I'm going to read them to you. Uh, and the doors are now locked, so you're going to be here until I finish reading them. Okay? Is that agreed? All right. And uh, the title is very catchy, The Holy Spirit and What Color is Your Parachute? And Father Mbelli, when I agreed, uh, 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 when I was flattered to be asked to speak to this distinguished group, uh, he wanted to get a jazzed-up title. Uh, so I jazzed it up a bit. And it's called The Holy Spirit and What Color is Your Parachute? The topic is uh, discernment. Uh, but I figured that even my eyes glazed at that title. So um, that's, the, that's the title. Now we'll see whether I deliver on the title. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read this. Normally I don't, but I will. Uh, feel free to clap at any time. <laughs> For all of my childhood, there was no television and radio appeared only 10 years before I did, the same year as did the women's right to vote. When I was a young lad, one-fifth, 20 out of every 100 workers in the United States was a farmer. Today, it is one out of 100, and no one in this room even knows a farmer, let alone has an aunt or an uncle who is a farmer. Also in my youth, the British Union Jack was the flag for one quarter of the planet. How many of you in the hall here own a cell phone? Please turn them off. <laughs> when I came to BC from the University of Michigan after teaching there 14 years, there were no cell phones anywhere. And there was a time, not too long ago, when Notre Dame was considered the preeminent college football team among Catholic colleges. I can remember that era. You probably can't if you're younger. My point is simple. The political, economic, and social circumstances of our life are constantly changing, often dr dramatically. And the world we see today is not the world of a decade ago, and most certainly will not be the world 25 or 50 years from now. Accepting this fact, fully accepting the fact of constant change, is an essential precondition for being a Catholic Christian. Let me say that. It's sort of my theme. Fully accepting the fact of, fact of constant change is an essential precondition for being a Catholic Christian. Catholics, to be true to our tradition, must accept a world that is constantly changing. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Jesus prepared us for all this, for those of us living in circumstances quite different from his world of first century Judaism. I tell you these things, Jesus said at the Last Supper, while I am still with you, I tell you these things. I will send the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, who will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you, will teach you everything. Catholic Christianity must be in constant conversation with and renewed by reflecting on this ever-changing world to discern what it is that the Holy Spirit is teaching us. There are two actors in this scenario. There is the church, which must constantly evaluate the message given her by Jesus in the light of the changing circumstances I have just mentioned. And then there are individuals, like you, like me, who must discern with the assistance of the Holy Spirit how to respond to the hands that we are dealt by life. Unlike the church, which continues to develop until Jesus will come again, each of us will reach completion when at last we return to God passing through the mystery of our death. The church is incomplete. It will go on. Our life will be complete. In brief, this is the Catholic view of how the Holy Spirit enters into the life of the church and our lives. Now, I have two tasks that I have put to myself tonight. 
First, to demonstrate how the Christian message has developed through the centuries in the life of the church, and then secondly, to outline how the Holy Spirit is present to us as we make our important life decisions. First, the development and the understanding of the Christian message. Some 20 years after Jesus' resurrection, right at the very beginning, at the head of the story, St. Paul wrote to a community near the present capital of Turkey called the Galatians. And this is what he wrote. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. These three assertions are fine examples of how the Holy Spirit works through and in time. Clearly, these statements are normative. How it should be if one is to be a follower of Christ, not positivistic statements describing how actually it is in the world. Early on, within the first half century of her existence, the church made it clear that all nationalities, all nationalities were called to be one in Christ. Christianity was not merely to be a Jewish sect. True as that is, we know full well that nationalism is still a problem even in the church. In the United States, for one example, German, Irish, Italian, and French Canadian Catholics have had at it over the years in many parts of this country and right here in New England especially. No longer slave or free. In Christ's time, slavery was common in the so-called known world, as it was in the unknown world, China, and among the Native Americans in the yet undiscovered New World. Slavery was worldwide. Indeed, 1,800 years after Jesus' resurrection, Christians, including many founders of our country, such as George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, held other people in bondage as slaves. To his credit, George Washington, in his will, freed his slaves. But to his discredit, Thomas Jefferson, author of the phrase, all men are created equal, he willed his slaves at Monticello as property to his heirs. It took a passage of 18 centuries before Christians finally saw that human bondage was incompatible with their beliefs. That's a short fraction of the time since Christ. Working through time, the Holy Spirit needs that time. Male and female. The first century world of the Romans, as well as the biblical Jewish world and elsewhere, was a totally patriarchal society. Within the lifetime of everyone here this evening, the women's movement has introduced many dramatic changes into the relationship between men and women. But we are still in the midst of resolving this male-female dichotomy. Any major transition in society causes uncertainty, which produces the anguish and the acrimony that today is often associated with the question of proper roles for men and women in the church and in society at large. This brief sketch of this one scriptural passage from Galatians and its impact on history, I hope, suggests how the Holy Spirit moves through the church, even if many of us, if not most of us, are very slow learners. Someone has remarked, when God created time, he made plenty of it. Though for each of us, time is finite. So that's the first message I have, how the Holy Spirit, suggesting how the Holy Spirit works through time in the church and through society. Now, the second part is how the Holy Spirit might work in our lives in our decision process. And I have this purpose, for this purpose, I have two books. Thank you for staying. 
What is the color of your parachute? Have you, how many have ever heard of that title? Good, that's half. Bob? Now, Brian hadn't heard of it. Allie hadn't heard of it. So I was uh, striking out up here in the front row. Uh, but there it is. Then I have another book, The Spiritual, the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius. How many have ever heard of that? Eat your heart out, parachute. <laughs> That's marvelous. <laughs> um, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, so we got these two books I've got, and I'll come back to that uh, on, and what I want to say. Now you add into these two books, The Color of Your Parachute and The Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius, you add the Holy Spirit, and from that we're going to get the answer to the question, Get ready. How do I handle perplexity when I wake up in the morning to face decisions concerning me that are new and troublesome? That's what you need. You need color your parachute, you need the spiritual exercise of St. Ignatius, and you got to have the Holy Spirit mucking around in there. To make a good th decision, two things are requisite. First, you have to assemble all the relevant information we can and secondly, we have to make sure that we are free and honest with ourselves when we set about making that decision. A little bit more, the Holy Spirit's going to enter. Okay? Now, what color is your parachute? The back of this says, I bought this especially for this moment. Uh, this is a business expense, Mary Lou. <laughs> I think I ought to get to either get some money for it. I paid for it out of hard-earned Jesuit money. Uh, it's a hard, it's a best-selling book, it says right here on the back. Eight million copies have been sold. So I don't know you, 60% of you people never heard of it. Uh, have you heard of Shakespeare? You have, yeah. A lot of that's been sold, too. This book helps graduating seniors and others who find, want you to find employment or to choose a profession that they want to make. I am pretty well set in my line of business. So I haven't looked into this book too closely, but I understand that the book is very helpful in laying out relevant questions to ask and information to garner while getting that first job. Now, The Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius Loyola. That's also a best-selling book. Since, 19, since eight, uh, uh, 1556, five million copies of this little book have been sold, five million. It is not meant to be read, but rather used as a guide for someone making spiritual exercises over a period of time so as to be free to make a good decision. Now, the author is a man named St. Ignatius Loyola. Now, he's the founder of the Jesuits. How many in this room knew that? Okay, you know, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you know that now. St. Ignatius Loyola. And the Jesuits were founded uh, approved by the church in 1540. Now, there's an easy way to remember that, a e very easy way to remember that. The fax number at our office is 21540. Okay, so you can remember that. Father Neenan's fax number is the same year in which the Society of Jesus were founded. That'll be an easy way to remember that because you know my fax number. 1540, okay. For one or two of the critical decisions in your life, Ignatius envisions one going off for 30 or 40 days to free oneself from all those daily distractions that keep us from focusing on what is really important. Jesuits, in the course of their training, as does, did Father Barth and did I, made two 30-day retreats. But most of us here this evening probably won't have the opportunity for such a retreat. But all of us will be getting up every morning, and we must face the challenges that require some very important decisions to be made. And Ignatius has some suggestions in this spiritual exercise book that may help us here. One such suggestion is to envision oneself at the end of your life and to ask the question, what will I wish I would have done? So when you're making that important decision, and you want to get free, you ask yourself, 
at the end of my life, whether it's a year from now, 10 years, 80 years from now, what, looking back on my life at this moment, will I wish I would have done? The intent here is to free a person from all irrelevant concerns, the static in our lives that distract us and reduce our freedom to make a good decision for the long run. <coughs> Pardon me. An example of such an issue would be, for example, quote, I don't want to go to college in Boston because it sometimes snows there and I always wear flip-flops. By imagining yourself at the end of a long life, you may realize that you would wish to have bought some shoes and socks and stored the flip-flops till next summer, or even settled with occasionally wearing them to the bathroom, rather than choosing the University of Southern California with flip-flops year-round. No offense to the University of Southern California, but that's what they wear out there, I'm told. That would be the only reason to go there, too, I suspect. Just kidding. This is on film. Just kidding. <coughs> so now here we're making this important decision. Let's assume that I've listed the pros and cons for two courses of action, and I've developed certain freedom, and now I'm faced with the time to make this decision. At this point, Ignatius would have us listen quietly in our heart and learn whether I am basically and radically comfortable with one or other course of action. In this interior silence, free of self-deception, the Holy Spirit is going to be present. And Ignatius tells us then, whatever decision I make, it may be very painful, it may be a very painful, difficult decision, but whatever decision I make will be the correct one if, after making it, painful though it be, I feel at peace. That's the spiritual exercises. So you get the facts as well as you can. You lay them out. Then you try to get freedom before those facts. And then you reflect in quiet. And then suddenly in that quiet, maybe painful, but you'll say, this is what I should do. And Ignatius says, a test of whether that's a good decision after you've made that perhaps hard decision, if you're at peace with it, it's a good one. And the Holy Spirit was with you. You haven't forced it, you haven't constrained yourself, uh, but you're at peace. Now I have a quiz, which relates to what I've been saying, and will let you know whether you've been following and agreeing with what I've been saying. In the light of what I said, does this phrase seem to be a good Catholic dictum to follow? Here's the phrase. Pray is if everything depends on God, and work if it all depends on you. Pray is if everything depends on God, work is if everything depends on you. Is that a basic Catholic dictum? How many say yes? Raise your hands. How many say no? Well, the correct answer is no. Uh, this, this, that phrase fits well on a sampler um, that Benjamin Franklin might have written, but St. Ignatius would have none of it. I'm going to try to explain that. Praise of all dependent on God is not correct because everything doesn't depend on God. There must be our own efforts. You have to lay out all the facts, pro and con. That's hard work. You've got to lay them out, honestly. Making the sign of the cross does not guarantee that the free throw will be successful. That's praying as if everything depended on God. You ought to try practicing a few free throws, George, in addition to blessing yourself. Blessing yourself is fine. You get 100 days indulgence, but you, you really ought to practice your free throws, especially in your for the end of the game. And this is where the colored parachute and getting all the relevant information enters the equation, as well as making sure that I am free and not just kidding myself, that I want this answer. I want to wear flip-flops. So I say, okay, I got to wear flip-flops. It's the only way to go. Life depends on flip-flops, so I'm going to Southern California. Well, 
I've, I've, I've destroyed my freedom. Now, work as if all depended on you is incorrect because simply getting that information is not enough since I must reflect on how that information should be used in my situation. And for this, one needs the assistance of the Holy Spirit in that peace and quiet where I enter into my heart after I've got the facts, I've made myself free, and I enter now into my, into my inner self, and that's where the Holy Spirit enters in. So the following dictum attributed to St. Ignatius is not as tidy as the one I've just given, but it captures accurately, in my mind, the essence of appropriate decision-making in the Catholic tradition. And this is sort of what I'm saying, this dictum now. Pray as if all depended on you, and work as if all depended on God. Pray as if it all depended on you, and work as if it all depended on God. Sort of all mixed up, isn't it? This is the discredited dictum is like a layer cake. We got God on one level, on us on another level separated by some frosting. The Catholic tradition, the dictum I'm proposing, is a marble cake. The Holy Spirit in each of us is intertwined in a large twirl. We interact. We're inseparable. And that's the Ignatian insight, that our, that our, our decisions should be intertwined, not relying entirely on ourself. We have to do what we need to do, but we have to rely on God, and somehow God's going to be acting, interacting with us as we make this decision. That's what I came here to say tonight. So if I may, and I'm going to conclude now with a little prayer, and then I'm told by Brian and Father Mbelli, if you care to make any comments or ask any questions, I'm to stand right how you're here and not to move away from the microphone. So I'm going to do that. I always do what I'm told. I took a vow of obedience in the Jesuits. So if I may say a little prayer now. Come Holy Ghost, Creator blessed, and in each of our hearts we ask that you take up your rest. When we are anxious and fearful, give us courage. When we are angry, give us hope and promise. When we are lonely and feeling abandoned, we ask that you be a strong support for us. And in the midst of unsettling change and uncertainty, grant each of us assurance that I am not alone in this world, but have that Holy Spirit that is promised by Jesus to us as my friend and special support. <laughs>